Hello, let's start. Good afternoon, we now start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor Paola Lettieri, Pro Provost UCL East, UCL's new campus on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, where we have brought in under one roof all faculties of UCL to tackle some of the global and grand challenges we're all facing today and into the future. So when we talk about inflation, that is certainly very much a, the challenge of today that is affecting all of us here in the UK, in Europe and around the world. So it is really with great pleasure that I would like to welcome Ignazio Visco, Governor of the Banca d'Italia, who joins us today at UCL to talk about inflation, the reasons why it has been rising and uh, the um, attempts to control it uh, and the prospects for monetary policy moving forward. The event today is uh, co-hosted between UCL and OMFIF, which is the uh, mo official monetary and financial institutions forum. It's really a great pleasure to see all of you with us today in person in the lecture theatre, but I am aware that a number of colleagues from the public and the private sector are also following the lecture online, so I would like to welcome all of you online as well. Following the lecture, we will have a conversation with a question and answers session that will be chaired by David Marsh, chairman of OMFIF, and our own professor Salim Bahaj from the Department of Economics. Following that, I hope that you can join us. You'll be able to join us in the South Cloisters here at UCL for a short reception. But I would like to invite now Professor Antonio Guarino, head of the Department of Economics at UCL, to introduce Governor Bisco. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Paola, for uh, uh, joining us today and represent the uh, senior leadership team of, uh, of UCL, of the college. Uh, Governor Visco, uh, welcome, benvenuto. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, welcome to the other representatives from Bank of Italy, from OMFIF, in particular David Marsh, who is the, the chairman, uh, other colleagues from the private and the public sector and, uh, and the press. Uh, thank you to our Dean Jennifer Hudson for uh, uh, joining us. Uh, thanks to all the other members of uh, uh, UCL, Department of Economics, and other departments. And of course, thanks uh, to all of you, the students. Uh, uh, it's a particular moment because we are not in term, and moreover, the exams are coming, so we understand the pressure, but it's very nice to see many of you today for this, uh, for this event. This uh, event is joined with OMFIF and Department of Economics, but as usual, we uh, uh, get help from the Economist Society, which is the society of undergraduate students who always offer great help. Thank you, thank you guys. Um, so, um, Governor Visco has been a governor since 2011, so he, he served for two terms, but he has been at the Bank of Italy for, I suspect, 50 years, right? So really a very loyal employee of the Bank of Italy with some uh, uh, some little uh, flirts somewhere with someone else, like uh, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, I think you were at Penn for a PhD in uh, economics. Some of uh, our students and faculty also went to Penn, so they will feel particularly uh, close to, to you. But apart from these small uh, uh, you know, periods elsewhere, always at the Bank of Italy and, you know, uh, uh, the last two terms, which is quite uh, impressive. So you have seen a lot of things, right? You have seen inflation, stagflation, uh, the introduction of a new currency, the euro, which is an amazing thing for a central banker. 
banking crisis, financial crisis in 2007-8, uh, the burst of the iTech bubble at the, you know, 2000, uh, then the pandemic, of course, more recently, and of course, being governor of the uh, Bank of Italy, dealing with Italian politicians in Rome uh, about uh, an economy which is uh, not in great shape for the last uh, couple of decades, at the very least. So really, a lot of things. So congratulations for all you have done. We have at UCL a great uh, tradition in terms of central bankers who come here just before they step down. Because uh, in 2020, our last event in person uh, before COVID, before the lockdown, was with Mark Carney. He gave the last lecture, the last event ever at, uh, at UCL before, uh, before, uh, uh, before stepping down. So we were very pleased to have Mark Carney at the time, and we are very honored to have you, to have you here. Uh, as Paola said, uh, Governor Visco is going to talk about inflation. Uh, if inflation has been a novelty for you uh, in your life, it's great news. It means you are very young. Because, you know, if you were a bit older, you would remember inflation in the old times when having 10% or 7% inflation was kind of, kind of normal and you would live with it. Why? Now people say, wow, there is inflation. It's a, it's a historical thing that happens. We, we thought, you know, central bankers had dealt and economists had dealt with it, but it's never, uh, it's never, it's never enough. I know I have to be short. Uh, he is already uh, upset with me, but uh, two more minutes, two more minutes to say something about UCL to the governor. The governor is uh, originally from Naples, he was born in Naples, and he knows that one of the first chairs of political economy, if not the first chair of political economy in the world, was at the University of Naples. And the first professor of economics was Antonio Genovesi. There is always an Antonio at the beginning of good stories. Okay, that's, that's a joke, but... Uh, uh, now, Governor Visco, UCL was the first chair, or one of the first chairs, these things are always a bit debated, of political economy in the UK. And it was established in 1828, UCL is 1826. The chair in honor of David Ricardo was uh, um, 1828. 20, you know, sometimes people get confused and think uh, Adam Smith was the first economist, but he was not an economist, right? He, he had the chair of moral philosophy, while here at UCL we established economics as an independent, an independent discipline. Uh, anyway, uh, this is all for me. Uh, now the floor is for Governor Risco. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to both uh, Paola and Antonio. Thank you to David. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, Genovese might have been the first chair, but Galliani was the greatest economist before him. So we can say Smith stays at uh, whatever, like Genovese uh, or, or Galliani stays at, at, at Genovese. But um, no, yes, I come from Naples, but uh, I've been uh, living around the world. And uh, it is true, it's 50 years that I, 51, that I was hired from the Bank of Italy. I studied, I was hired, but the first two years I was at Penn in Philadelphia from 72 to 74. So they don't count as, uh, as far as working is concerned. After that, uh, I've been uh, testimony of a number of the things that have been mentioned by Antonio and uh, uh, I did not cause them, inflation, stagflation, bank crisis, and so on. It may be Granger causality, we can, we can accuse that, but, but I've been around, and yes, I remember uh, inflation, real inflation in the 1970s and 80s. It was double digit or uh, between 10, 20 percent in this country, in, uh, in Italy, in uh, the U.S., um, the only country that really did uh, decently 
Well, but it had inflation in the five, six, seven percent was was Germany. Uh, I will talk today about the uh, return of inflation. Uh, uh, I will say a few things uh, about uh, the sources, uh, as I see them, of inflation uh, in uh, two major areas of the world. You will forgive me, I will not discuss the UK, I know little, but I will talk about a little bit, I'll compare the US and the, the Euro area. I will then uh, somehow discuss the current situation and uh, the main drivers that we still have to face as far as inflation is concerned, the effectiveness of monetary policy, the outlook and uh, uh, the risks ahead. Um, Well, this is inflation is back. That, that, that there is nothing you, you can say. Uh, after uh, uh, three decades of uh, really price stability, uh, three decades in which we had uh, in the last uh, part of the, uh, from 2010 to 2020, uh, risks actually of excessive disinflation or deflation just to understand what is price stability. Price stability, as far as we are concerned in central banking, is not uh, zero uh, rates of change of prices. We have an idea that uh, because of measurement errors, because of need, needs for of adjustment in the economy, more or less 2% is what we call price stability. As you can see, it has been much lower than that. Uh, it went close to zero. Uh, in, uh, in, in between 2012 and 2019, it went down uh, with the shock, the COVID shock, it went up now. And uh, I'm trying to <laughs> tell you uh, something about this. Uh, obviously, the causes of the risks of deflation or excess disinflation are uh, linked to what happened uh, before 2010 or around 2010, the global financial crisis on one side and the sovereign debt crisis in the euro area. But I will not talk about that. I will talk about the different sources of inflation across the Atlantic. There is the, the Atlantic is left. Now, uh, there are two things. The first is that <clears throat> there are four things. The first is the fact that fiscal policy has been uh, one of the main drivers of demand in the United States. We had uh, in the United States public debt increasing by 25 percentage points to up to 130 percent of GDP in a matter of one year or slightly less, slightly, slightly more than one year. Uh, in the euro area, the increase was about 15 percentage points to less than 100 percent. And despite the deeper decline in nominal GDP in 2020 and a much slower recovery in 2021, the uh, uh, exceptional support that was provided to the United States households, the American households, uh, through the budgetary policy is evident when we compare the dynamics of output and disposable income, GDP versus disposable income. Uh, GDP went down in 2020 by about 3% in real terms. Household disposable income increased by 6%, one of the high, uh, largest increases in real terms of uh, disposable income in America. Uh, in Europe, well, in Europe, GDP fell more than in the United States, if I remember, about 5%, between 5 and 6% in real terms. Disposable income did not increase. This gives already an idea about how strong has been the push from the fiscal side. Uh, at the same time, we have had from the, the uh, different sources of uh, uh, stimulus, in both, uh, in both areas, different effects on demand. Now, we have to ask, ask why was this stimulus? Well, now we are forget, for, 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 for forgetting it, but in uh, 2020, in February, March 2020, uh, we were extremely scared, all of us. And uh, uh, the scare was that uh, the world would not have been anymore like it used to be. Uh, there would have been uh, scars remaining 
in each one of us, uh, distancing being a factor that would remain for long, much longer than it actually happened. And, and the government decided, uh, the governments decided that it was necessary really to uh, overcome the risks of a major depression out of that by, by substantially increasing transfers. At the same time, um, the central bank, we, uh, I'm a member of the governing council of the ECB and we had a lot of discussions, mostly or all of them during that period by video conference, uh, decided that we should somehow supply all the liquidity that was needed to avoid a combination of the recessionary uh, factors and financial fragilities. And so we maintained what was at the time a quantitative easing in place that we were getting out from that. Uh, that was introduced, uh, if there will be questions, I will talk about that later. That was introduced before 2000, around 2014, 15, uh, and uh, we maintained it. So we continue to accommodate the economy. But uh, the differences here are very evident. The fiscal push in the United States was such that uh, very quickly uh, the demand, the consumption demand in, the, in Eurobus uh, increased above the trend that uh, had prevailed before the pandemics. And uh, by 30%, if, if you look, uh, the increase in mid-21, uh, in uh, service sector less so, the return to trend only took place at the end of last year. In the euro area, we still are below trend, and uh, in both uh, goods and services. So there is, uh, in a sense, uh, a difficulty in identifying excess demand as a possible corporate of inflation in in our area the third thing has to do with the labor market uh, the labor market has been much tighter in the united states than than in uh, in the euro area the unemployment rate there now is about three three point five percent in uh, in uh, euro area six six and a half uh, the interesting thing is the vacancies who are much uh, higher than the unemployed in the United States and much lower than unemployed in the Euro area. The difference between the two is 4 million now, it used to be larger, uh, 4 million in the US, more vacancies than unemployed, and uh, 6 million unemployed more than vacancies, so than job uh, opportunities in, in the Euro area. Obviously, there is heterogeneity across countries, across sectors, and so on, but this tells you something, that uh, the combination of uh, the uh, push in demand and the difficulty in finding people to go back to work, because much of this depended on the fact that uh, many people left the labor force during the pandemic, uh, had uh, uh, another effect in the United States that pushed up prices, which was wage increases. Uh, the reservation wage was higher, and at the same time, wage pushes were very, very strong. Nothing like that in Europe. As a matter of fact, the, what we observe is in the US still uh, wage growth of about 5-6%, much higher than the target 2%, if you want, of inflation, even if you discount for productivity growth in in the euro area until the end of last year we were below three percent um, there is a fourth component the fourth component has to do with uh, the energy shock now this played an extremely different role across the two sides of the atlantic uh, you are familiar with gas prices we import them imp used to import them mostly from russia and it was in continental Europe, it, it was a very important component of uh, uh, energy production. Uh, the, uh, in the United States, um, during this period, now you don't see, there was a substantial increase. From this, you don't see the uh, gas price went from around $10 per megawatt hour, that is the measure, uh, before the pandemic, to a peak of over 30. Now, 30 over 10 is a substantial uh, percentage increase. 
uh, then now it's back at, uh, around 10. In uh, the euro area, it was about 10 euros per megawatt hour in early 2020. Uh, it rocketed to 180 before the war, the invasion of the aggression of Ukraine from Russia. Uh, it went to a peak of, of 350 in the summer of last year. It's down now at less than uh, 40, around 40. Now, the extreme volatility here uh, can be explained by a number of factors. It is, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a classical bull with effect that is we order more, we order, uh, say, uh, earlier, we replenish the stocks. But the, why did it start? And this is a mistake in our understanding, at least uh, in 21, because we thought this started in Europe from mid-21 on. We thought that it was related to the cold winter in Russia. It was related to the difficulties, diplomatic and economic difficulties between Germany and Russia on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, it was most likely a geopolitical problem, a geopolitical problem that ended with, with the war. And, uh, and this uh, has a substantial effect, very substantial effect. Uh, I will talk about this very quickly. Um, what we, we, we can see it from, from just these figures. Uh, core inflation uh, and headline inflation. The difference between the two, there are many ways to compute core inflation, but the difference here is energy and food prices, basically. They are excluded from the core. And uh, uh, it is still around 2% uh, in uh, mid-21. As a matter of fact, core inflation mid-21 in Europe was closer or below perhaps to 1%. In the US, it was already, already at around 5% in March 21. Demand factors, there was a push. Uh, the distancing was no more uh, uh, in a main, a main activity or lack of activity. Uh, the, uh, what happened was a, a pent up demand that was very much uh, there, given the transfers that were accumulated and the savings that had risen so much in, uh, in the American households. Um, the, so, so from 5% already, in, uh, in early 21, it went up, uh, it went up, uh, as you see, uh, there, uh, up around 10%, and then started to go down uh, in uh, mid-22. In Europe, it was much less so. Uh, only around, uh, I remember, in, in July, we had the last meeting of, uh, for our uh, revision of monetary policy strategy. Uh, we had this meeting, we discussed a lot, and at the end we decided to maintain a 2% inflation as a medium-term target to make it symmetric, meaning up or down has the same, the same value, and, uh, and uh, it is a medium-term. But we were trapped, number of reasons, uh, QE easing, uh, quantitative easing was uh, uh, a, an unconventional kind of monetary policy measure. Uh, we were creating money purchasing bonds in order to maintain the interest rates across the spectrum, uh, the horizon, at l sufficiently low levels to, uh, to have financing conditions for the economy that were favorable and a revival of demand that was pretty depressed at the time. Uh, the, the, the discussion was how to get out from this trap, if you want. Uh, the, the, uh, Keynes used to talk about the liquidity trap. Uh, we were talking about the effective lower bound, some differences in, in modeling, but basically they say that you cannot use interest rates. They cannot be reduced more than, uh, than where they are. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, how do you generate inflation? You generate inflation for, for a guidance trying to tell what is that you're trying to achieve, uh, creating money, liquidity, but that not per se, not because we had an idea that uh, this generates immediately 
income and 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 consumption, but mostly because it helped maintaining interest rates along the whole time horizon at level that would favor a recovery in investment and then in demand. But then this happened. Basically, the interesting thing is that in our discussions we were trying to see how we could stimulate a, a, a return to two percent fighting uh, a de-anchoring of inflation expectations downward and we were saying that we have to tell somehow that we would allow for inflation to be even a bit higher than the two percent target in order to achieve that uh, but then there was the energy shock it was coupled with bottlenecks uh, what are bottlenecks bottlenecks are basically uh, the difficulty in getting uh, all uh, semi-finished products, raw materials and so on, uh, to uh, produce final goods that may meet the demand by consumers uh, and firms. And uh, these bottlenecks actually took place very clearly in the United States. We had some spillover there. The automotive industry especially had problems with the chips and so on but you know that was something that we were observing already mid mid 2021 mm. they didn't pay too much attention that was a, a mistake but the energy crisis with the increase in natural gas we thought that would be a temporary issue temporary because of the these Nord Stream 2 disputes because of other uh, the, the, the winter would have taken care of of it and so on and all projections all projections by future in, incorporated in futures markets or the projection by special and so on were basically saying back to 50 40 50 by uh, the spring of 2022 20, so that was the framework uh, and then we had we had this uh, this uh, uh, ukraine uh, uh, war. Th that really transformed what we thought as a temporal phenomenon in a prolonged one. Um, the, the question is, uh, uh, well, what you do when from a temporary one there is a prolonged one? Well, first of all, you have to understand that already end of 21, we had clear that uh, the pandemic effects were more or less not over, but substantially absorbed. We were thinking that therefore it was time to get out from the excessive extreme uh, easing uh, accommodation uh, of the economy and have something called normalization. We want the normal monetary policy. This means taking out interest rates from the negative levels that we had, amazingly negative. When I was your age, uh, obviously, if we said that interest rates, no interest rate could have been uh, below zero, we probably would have been, uh, we've got an F in our, in our, in our exams. Uh, but uh, actually we did it. Uh, so we were paying some, somebody in order for him to accept our loans. Pretty, pretty old. Uh, but uh, we wanted to exit from that. Uh, and we decided at the end of 21 that we would have done it normally in by first stopping purchasing bonds public and private and then raising rates where they had to to go at the normal level uh, it was planned to stop the purchasing in the first semester and to raise rates just afterwards there was the war that happened 24th of february uh, we were pretty pretty worried uh, we decided to somehow maintain our stance, but really not anticipate uh, a further rise, a rise in interest rate getting out from there. Uh, we wanted to see, uh, in a very uncertain circumstances, what would have taken, what had happened, and uh, uh, but then, and we had, as a matter of fact. Uh, an increase in gas prices was pretty, pretty, pretty strong, but it was still a supply side shock. It was supply side. We knew that the supply side, if it is temporary, we can wait. If it is prolonged, we have to be worried about second round effects. 
What are second round effects? Second round effects are demand effects that are generated by uh, an accommodation of the shock uh, with wages increasing, uh, profit margins perhaps not falling or perhaps increasing also, and the kind of uh, uh, distributional uh, uh, exchange taking place uh, between capital and labor, as we used to say, uh, and, and this could perpetuate the shock. Now, what is the shock? The shock is an external increase in a raw material price. Uh, it is a terms of trade effect. It's a negative terms of trade to all of us. Uh, what can we do? Well, we cannot send it back where it comes from. Uh, you have, must understand that I lived in the 19, early 70s. I was the one that was doing in the Bank of Italy as a young researcher all the work about wages, indexation, and so on. So I had that experience. And the basic thing you have to do is to absorb it. Stop it. You don't increase wages to compensate for that. Wages fall, there is a shock, 10%, they fall by that. There is, uh, governments can intervene, can try to redistribute to protect those who are more fragile, more hit and so on, but you cannot start a compensation of the loss in purchase and power through asking higher wages from firms who in order to provide that, have to increase their prices. So there is a kind of spike. We had that textbook experiment in the 70s, uh, and we knew that we didn't want that. So we were prepared to fight for this second round effect. The problem is that this high uncertainty. We don't know how long this will take place. We don't know whether this uh, will cause counter effects because if the purchasing power goes down, real disposable income goes down and perhaps consumption goes down and so on. So the idea was, let's see how, how things develop. They weren't developing very much. And indeed, starting in mid, in July 22, we had a number of increases of interest rates, rapid and sizable. At the end, we increased rates by 350 basis points, 3.5% in between July and March of this year. So eight months, very strong reaction. Uh, the, uh, what happened to prices then? Well, what happens is that as you see at a certain point headline, which means the overall consumer price index started uh, having a rate of growth, a rate of increase, which was continuously lower over time. We are now at around 7%. It was up to 11, more or less. In the US, similarly, it started before. <clears throat> the component of, uh, uh, that, that of headline inflation that was the main factor in this reduction was energy prices. It is gas prices went back from 350 down to 40, uh, and they are uh, entered directly into the consumer price index because all of us uh, use electricity uh, for a number of purposes in our households, and they enter indirectly in the core components, that is the uh, con prices, cons consumer prices of goods and services other than energy and food, uh, indirectly because you have to use energy to produce them or you have to use uh, gasoline to, uh, for transportation or for uh, a number of uh, production activities. The interesting thing is that, uh, however, core inflation continued to rise. It is now at 5.7%. And this notwithstanding the increase in rates, the restrictive monetary policy. Uh, in the United States also, you see, uh, indeed, the, the core inflation stopped uh, rising. So the question is, and this is uh, the, the important, important question, Let, let's see if I, uh, I want, before that, I want to discuss this, because this is an interesting uh, uh, exercise. Uh, the, 
we, we, we want to understand what are the drivers of inflation. This is for, for some of you may do some econometrics. This just to tell you what it is. It is a vector autoregression Bayesian in which there is a number of shocks which are modeled. They are uh, shocks on uh, that come from demand, shocks can come from supply, shocks which are uh, domestic, shocks which are foreign, uh, global, global, and and risk uh, or uncertainty. Uh, all these shocks are uh, captured by these exercises, and at the end they produce these kind of charts. Not easy to read, but basically. It, if you go in depth, there is, uh, there is a paper which has been produced by some of my staff. It tells you that in the United States, the, oh, this is the difference starting from 2022, the beginning of 22. If you go down from 21, you have a different picture. In there, you have that it is overwhelming supply in Europe. Uh, you still have uh, substantial supply, light, light blue there, as a main factor of the change in inflation expectations. So if you start with, uh, on the right, you see basically an extraction of inflation expectations, 2.6 now in these uh, five-year expected changes average. Uh, um, and uh, on the left is, is the, the components, how, how much it is the changes accumulated. But you know, the, the interesting thing is that the supply is the dominant factor in 2022. Blue, hard blue is demand. It starts increasing, especially since mid-22. Uh, it is counteracted by monetary policy, mostly American, because there are spillovers. Now you see the red, the mon monetary policy from the, federal, from the ECB is biting. Uh, in the US, it's mostly demand. This is, this is clear, and the effect of monetary policy is there. Now, uh, has been effective? Well, there have been many, many criticisms. One criticism is, is that we started too late. I tried to say, not really, I don't think so. The second criticism is uh, you made major mistakes. Of course, you made major mistakes in forecasting, as everybody around the world. Nobody predicted the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, all futures markets were basically convinced that natural gas prices would go back where they started from during the early part of 2022. But uh, this policy has been effective. Real interest rates measured uh, here with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, the uh, interest rate swaps, uh, they basically show that in real terms, uh, they are now at zero, more or less, a little bit above zero. If you read the literature about what is the natural rate of interest, there are things called natural, I don't know what does it mean, equilibrium perhaps, long-term equilibrium, or neutral in the sense that uh, uh, th with those rates, there is no need really to act in terms of stabilization policies, but they, they tell that now, uh, these rates should be around that, that level because of demographic factors, because of productivity growth, and so on, a number of components. There are many measures that, that which attempt to somehow identify these uh, uh, unmeasurable uh, uh, variable, uh, but around zero. This is a little bit above. So in this sense, we have been able to go back where we wanted to be. And, sorry. Let's see if I can, yeah. And indeed, if you look at the market-based inflation expectations, again, you extract them from index-linked uh, uh, swap contracts, inflation-linked. Uh, uh, there, there are techniques in finance to get there. Uh, one year, basically, it, it, is, uh, it is what you observe. It went up, and now it is below around 3%. 10 year, 10 year, well, it is a 2%. As a matter of fact, if you take out the risk premium, it is exactly 2. Uh, and um, basically, this says that they are anchored. Inflation expectations, the as the market sees them, are anchored. Uh, one asks, how is it possible long-term 10-year 
uh, expected inflation is uh, is still a two after all this. Well, and why do we need to care about the ten year inflation? Uh, rate of change, inflation expectation. It, it is possibly a measure of the credibility of monetary policy. So, uh, if monetary policy is credible, even if you have this uh, uh, spike in inflation, which is already over, but uh, it has been very violent, then, and if you think that at the end, for example, households may have a backward looking way of generating inflation expectations, they may be adaptive, regressive, whatever, uh, or simply extrapolative, uh, then uh, you see actually now they return to the normal, which is, which is a very important, a poor, important uh, fact. And also, uh, tail risks uh, of uh, excessive inflation have receded from the peaks of mid-22, uh, and uh, you see them uh, from here, this is the probability of being above 3% or the probability below 4%. They, they, they were very high in early 22, they are much lower, above 3%. And below 4%, they are. Uh, the, the, this is the percentage of people answering. So 60% of people in early 22 were thinking that inflation would have been maintained much above our target. Uh, it, it is much less. There is a, a, a some increase in the last few months. It is when we have st started observing that core inflation stopped reducing. Uh, as Matvad did not start reducing. Um, and uh, uh, there has been dispute. In the last few few days, I think, a few few weeks, I think the financial stability preoccupations may, may matter more and this may return. Now, the, the other component that, to understand whether there is an effect of monetary policy is the uh, looking at the aggregates. Uh, the, the, the thing here is very clear. Credit is going down dramatically in terms of change. It was extremely high, about 13% in August 22, the change one year on year, and it is now minus 1% uh, for, uh, as far as firms are concerned. Uh, the same happens with the measure of money. In real terms, they are very much in negative territory. So just to go on uh, in the outlook, I know that I'm a little bit longer as usual. Uh, the, well, I think that this tells you that there is significant tightening in credit supply. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, this is my last, last uh, uh, chart, an issue here. Assume that we are effective. Can we do everything by ourselves? Uh, and uh, I am in these, uh, at times, considered by the press as a dove, one that would say, uh, somehow, be very cautious. Uh, I, I mean, my history is that I'm very much worried about inflation. I've always been very much uh, in the camp of those who, are, who think that the second round effects are very. But we live in a very uncertain times. We have to, uh, we don't know really. The, uh, range around our projections is extremely large. If we have a projection going back to 2.2 uh, in uh, by mid 25, uh, it may be between uh, I don't know 0 0.5 and 4. It is as a matter of fact, the more you, you you progress, the higher is the 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 range. Now the big problem here is actually that we have two risks: one of doing too much and the other of doing too little. Some of my colleagues say it's better to err on the size of doing too much. I think it's wrong. I think we don't know enough about that. And the risk of, do, of doing uh, too, too, too much is at least as large as that of doing too little. If we do too little, and it is actually too little, we have to do more and cost more in the future. If we do too much and it is uh, generating uh, risks to the economy, financial stability risk being part of them and so on. This may have non-linear amplification effects in the balance sheets of firms. It may have problem, produce problems in mortgages, and those countries which have high private debt may suffer very much. 
uh, the, these, these have to be put there together. I think it is wise for us, and this is what we are now saying, to decide meeting by meeting on the basis of the data that we see in, com in coming data. We, this is what we are doing. There, are, there is one thing, and I close, close with that. The second round effects in, means that uh, once you had the push, the attempt of wages to make up for the loss in purchasing power may push labor costs up, prices may increase, these uh, either in an indexed economy, the euro, or in a de facto index economy, produces a spiral. This is a second round. But it is not only wages, it is also profit margins. And the question is, what's happening to profit margins? Uh, and I, I'm worried, these this are something what, that tells you some, what happened in the last year or so. <coughs> you see, uh, in the various sectors in Italy, not much happened. In Germany, especially in the service sector, the one which is less uh, affected by interest rate changes, say, uh, leisure or uh, transportation may, especially by, uh, if there are effects also on, on energy. But uh, what you observe is that there have been increases in profit margins, which are hard to explain already. The problem is the following. Uh, we had the cost push. The cost push has been, from energy, has been transferred through a pass-through in final prices. Manufacturing and then trade to consumer prices. Uh, it's correct. If there is no change in the distribution of income, implies wages and uh, profits should not should not adjust. Assume that, but, but there has been the pass through. Now, and there are long lags before monetary policy really has effect, and also lags before the pass through is is completed. Uh, now we are observing much lower energy prices. They fail. The question is, will the pass-through work in reverse? If it does not work in reverse, profit margins will increase. And if they increase, there is more ammunition for the uh, wage price spiral. So this is what we are now. This is why I say that mon monetary policy is very effective and important, but should not be the only game in town. Uh, should not be the only game in town, and it should be supported at least by fiscal policy, not uh, uh, being targeted, but not uh, ha you cannot solve this problem increasing debt. And the second thing, it has also, I think, be supported by responsible behavior of what in continental Europe we used to call social partners, which means trade union, but also here, unions are, have been used to be pretty effective uh, and, and the business sector. Uh, I'm one of those who says we should engage in conversation, discuss. Uh, I remember the major failure in Italy in the 1970s and 80s with indexation, 100% indexation, maintaining this uh, spiral gone and generating exchange rate the depreciations that were somehow adding to the spiral. But I remember also what we did after the exiting the SM in 1992. Uh, depreciation of 30%, nothing happened to prices. Inflation went down. How? Well, there was an agreement forced by discussion, by explanation, by my predecessor, uh, Champi, or my boss Champi at the time, was governor of the Bank of Italy and then president of the, Repub of the uh, prime minister and then president of the Republic. At the time, he was engineering this uh, substantial response of business and unions. That was very effective. And I think in this case, I don't want to go back to all discussions of income policy. We used to have them in the 70s and 80s. But I think it is very important to that everybody was aware that if second round effects took place, then monetary policy could do no other things than tight, being tighter more. I don't think that we have to be, and I, I dispute the thing that being cautious means being complacent. But I think that in order not to be complacent, we have to be to understand that signals have to be there that tell us that actually the second round effects are not taking place. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you. That was really quite a, a, a tour de force. And also it's very good that you mentioned uh, the two sides of the social partnership at the end. Um, I think there's something also that Joachim Nagel, when he was uh, in Edinburgh the other day, also made the point, it's the two sides of industry here. Um, since you've given us a very, very thorough analysis, and we'd expect that from the Bank of Italia, because you do actually have the best uh, economic research of any central bank in Europe, we would expect that. Therefore, you've given us lots and lots of food for thought. Um, yeah, the best economy has government. Uh, well, easily, yes. Also, you gave us a little hint about your next career, maybe, that you're going to become some kind of conciliator. Uh, there may be the prime minister and there may be the president. You gave us a very strong hint there. But myself and Salim, I'm just going to ask you a few questions and then open it up to the audience. And I think we're going to have to overrun a little bit beyond our timetable. We wanted to end at about quarter past three. So I think you'll allow us to run on a bit before we have the, the break for tea, uh, which of course you're, you have to be looking forward to. Could I just pick up two points and then I'll hand over to Salima. One is this question about financial stability. You did mention that. Um, and you, you mentioned that would be another reason for, for your uh, being somewhat cautious, although not complacent, as, as you said. The fact that the banks in Europe are weak compared with their American competitors, that must be one of the reasons why they have come under particular attention uh, because of balance sheet weaknesses and so on. Isn't it a bit surprising that given the weakness of the banks, partly because they're relatively small, uh, there's not been more attention to drive forward banking union and, and to overcome this very fragmented uh, system that we have in uh, Europe. That's one question. If I may just bring in another point, which is shining through a lot of what you were saying. Um, you, you're saying there is this balance between doing too much and doing too little. You came up very much in favour, I think, of not doing too much. What are the actual trigger points that you're really looking for? Is it the core inflation rate in Europe, which is still unfortunately rising? Or is it this very sharp squeeze in credit conditions that you mentioned, which is partly a lagged effect, of course, of the, the uh, rises in interest rates of the last uh, nine months? So two questions. Very quickly. The, uh, I don't know. You may say uh, that the banking system is weaker or not. Uh, it is ve always very difficult to talk about banking system. I was here, uh, I remember which area, maybe to you, I don't know, or others, uh, Goldman Sachs, I don't know, talking about the banking system in uh, Italy, 2017. There was a nice uh, uh, picture on the first page of The Economist with uh, Bass, which was the Italian banking system going falling down and taking the whole Europe down. I was explaining that was not true. It was a small component. It was uh, under control. It has to do with certain with non-performing loans, but they were linked to the real economy. So don't worry. Have, they were very skeptical. But they're was, certainly small, aren't they? Yeah, right. JP Morgan spends more yeah. every year yeah. on, on just its, uh, you know, paying yeah. for its porterage, I think, so they, than, they, they uh, made a banks, making, make, that, banks making profits. They made a yeah. mistake. You have to know what it is. Mm. Now, in Europe, we don't have the business model, neither of Credit Suisse nor of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, nor uh, the smaller banks, which have to do a lot of cryptos. Uh, we have, uh, in these cases, some doubts about management. We certainly have uh, the issues about the regulation and perhaps supervision. So far, we think that the banking system in Europe is uh, perhaps having less returns, but that is not a real measure of the strength of a of, of But what's that driving forward banking union? You know, the, the problem is that the banks now have been regulated substantially not to have excessive risks, not to run excessive risks. So you should expect also to have less returns. The problem is that the cost of capital is still high. So there, there is presumption that the risk is there. But you know, the business model is totally different. We are not worried. There is a capital ratios are high, liquidity provisions are okay. The risk is there because of contagion. There is always a risk of spillovers. The way things happened in the last two cases, in the case of Credit Suisse, there was a, a rundown in deposits, a continuous uh, over time accelerated 
in the Silicon Valley, it was done with a click on your portable mm. and you moved all things out. 30%, 40% over a few hours. The Deutsche now, Bank, that was a bit alarming, wasn't it? This is that? alarming, yeah. it's very difficult, mm. something that we are going, we are discussing in the Basel Committee, in the Financial mm. Stability Board, it is a, a relevant issue. We have to be prepared on how to deal with that. You need to have a lot of information, and uh, when you take a bank run, you take out from somewhere and you put it somewhere else. So you have to understand where, where things are going. But just on my question, if I may, uh, if maybe you're going to be a future politician. Will, will you then drive forward banking union? No, yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course, <laughs> it, it is fundamental. Mm. But it, is, uh, it does not mean that uh, the banking union is uh, uh, only predicated on a few bits and pieces. So we, we, we can discuss the banking just, just before you... on credit, just oh, last go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Credit, uh, obviously this is a fundamental uh, information that we have. Very good chart that you made there. And it is going to bite, there is no question. So this is why I say <coughs> there is enough to be, a lot, be, be, be very looking very well at what's happening, but also uh, not to be too much alarmed because Monetary policy has effects in with long and variable lags, as someone said yeah. a number of years ago. <laughs> Can I ask, before you go on to um, David's second question, I want to well, ask no, you. He's one. answered it more or less. You, well, the second question on, uh, on trigger points. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you yeah. are, you're asking no, no, another but, one. But I would ask more about, about banks, if I may. Yeah. So, I, one thing that was interesting about the, the past month in the US was this trade off between the quality support and monetary policy. Like, I know that you're hiking at the same time as, as, as providing a sense of support to the banking system. And that's not something you, you mentioned during COVID, you know, that was a contributor to the, to the, to the rise in inflation you, you, you felt. Is your view that, you know, we actually have the right tools to manage those two different things? So if we have a, can we have a division between margin policy, interest rate policy and liquidity support? Or do you think they're sort of always well, uh, first of, sort of risk? Oh, oh, I, I understand this. Uh, I was saying before that uh, uh, I don't think that we should confuse a cautious policy with a complacent policy. Uh, this uh, is something that is uh, being written by one of the best, most respected monet young monetary theorists who teaches at Princeton, his name is Marcus Werner Meyer. Uh, these, the other thing that he says, look, be aware of the trade-off. I, I don't think that the second part is right, but uh, the first part is right. But the second part, I think, we have to discuss whether there is or not a trade-off. Now, there is no trade-off if we think that uh, these, uh, we aim at both price stability and being part of those who have to guarantee also financial stability for a simple reason, that financial stability is a necessary condition for price stability. If you have a much unstable financial sector, the risk is uh, of deflation, a debt to deflation, for example, which uh, you may have instability in prices, not only if there is inflation, but also if there is uh, excessive disinflation or deflation. At the same time, uh, financial stability, uh, the, the price stability is fundamental for financial stability. If you live in an inflation world, sooner or, or later there will be a major bankruptcy here or there. So the, the two go together. In this sense, there is no trade-off. The trade-off may be on the tools, because how do you maintain price stability and financial stability? I wrote a piece on central banking about five, six years ago, trying to explain um, exactly this. Uh, the the main motive, late motive at the time was, no, there are two different uh, instruments. There is uh, interest rates on one side, even it goes through all the cracks, as uh, Jeremy Stein was saying, and so on. So it may also be used for uh, provide an, uh, an edge against, against instability in the financial sector, but basically it is for monetary policy to counter risks of inflation. And you have macroprudential tools. 
Uh, now, macroprudential tools, this is a nice Timbergen exercise. You have two different tools, they don't talk to each other, uh, two objectives. The problem is that macroprudential is pretty difficult to maneuver. Uh, you cannot fine tune it, and certainly so far we have not seen major success stories. Well, also, you do have the famous transmission protection instrument, which could be an element of stability when it comes to indebted countries. Do you think that's ever going to be used, Ignacio? Oh, the, the tip mm. may be used, but it mm. is a liquidity instrument. Mm. And this is the, the issue he poses. Yeah. Mm. He poses, is there a trade-off between liquidity tools and interest rates? Well, this country has had success. In October, there was this problem, a serious problem. Yes. Uh, my understanding is at the end, the Bank of England did a good job. You mean the famous Trust Quateng yeah. experiment? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Well, the, the, you, you were experiment is a nice word, yeah. but uh, for us, it's a good experiment. I think it has a, it, it had a big impact on... We, on we, learn, uh, we learned learn from that. You learned from that, yeah. But, well, but, well then, the English have actually done something in Europe. That's but, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you <are most> of... <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, just for your information, every time I have to do with some friend, a British friend, they tell me, uh, I tell uh, we should do this, I explain a bit, a bit uh, a lousy way how I see things. I say, no, 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 things are this. You have to do inflation targeting independently from what the financial sector and so on. Then you have a major global financial crisis and so on. It's they, the same come later, oh, no, no, you have to take care of the financial instability when you do the inflation target because, and they teach you the lesson that you try to provide them, but they somehow weren't prepared. So there is always this. Yes. On the other hand, it depends. If there is a liquidity problem that is, uh, that takes place and you can deal with that temporarily, quickly and so on without close in sight of the other of the other objective this can be done and indeed lender of last resort is one of the two or three uh, main uh, main definition of what the central bank should do could, could i just ask you one question and then uh, Celine okay. will ask you a question and then we'll go to the audience because particularly we would like some students to ask questions and i believe there's some microphones here so please do think of some really good questions we're going to bundle together three questions from the audience but my, my monetary policy question is simply on the uh, reinvestment issue. It, one thinks that perhaps at the end of the second quarter you might stop any reinvestment of the famous APP bonds. I know you've not decided that yet. You could tell us what you think might happen there. And then you've got the PEP bonds at the end of the year. That could be the next shoe to fall. Do you think if you did stop reinvesting the famous PEP bonds that could really have an effect on spreads spreads have behaved themselves rather well partly because uh, signora meloni has been very well behaved but could all that come to an end if you start uh, the, the you, you start becoming a bit uh, more squeezing with the quantitative tightening well i i mean there are many ways to answer the first i would say is that we have announced very clearly that it will be measured uh, and predictable so we should not do this with, I mean, somehow to, uh, without announcing it, that we have thought pretty well how the pace of, of not reinvesting, if you want. I said, I said measured means, uh, in a measured way, in English, I suppose it means not all uh, at the time. Not in a trust and, way. But I don't, no, not a, certainly not that way. But mm -hmm. I, I th my impression is that, uh, uh, this uh, is somehow in good part uh, discounted by market. So uh, it, if we look at the rates as they are now, they take into account this and they take into account the continuation of policy. We may continue, we may reduce, we may, it, it has to be done giving uh, a look at what, uh, what the outlook is. So I'm not too much worried. I think I have to be vigilant on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I said uh, it's been very interesting to answer that question too. I had a question just on uh, expectations of inflation. So you saw us the market prices from the break evens and the swap markets, and you know, which have been flat in the ten year uh, rate is fantastic, great achievement to have such anchor expectations. But for households, you know, medium term expectations have actually risen and stayed relatively high during this episode. 
I was just wondering, how do you reconcile that? And are you more concerned about what households are saying? You think about second month effects, for example, compared to the market? Or are you thinking the houses are lagging, they'll catch up eventually, they're less informed? Um, I mean, I'll answer considering expectations, yeah. inflation expectations, the market inflation. Uh, obviously, the market uh, knows more than I do, and so I, I'm not prepared. But, <laughs> but uh, I know, I mean, my dissertation was on inflation expectations, on price expectations in the 19, uh, from 1950 to 1974. Uh, perhaps uh, not until 1980, but the, until 74, there was, the, I mean, any idea of Russian expectations could work. They were stationary, there was no change in regime. And then there was this uh, oil shock and all the old inflation. So what happens to inflation expectations? Well, in that moment, they tend to be adaptive or extrapolated, not the market necessarily, but certainly the business and, and the households. And this is what we have observed. Uh, household expectations are higher now than uh, the market, but they're going down. And not only, and we, we have surveys, and we look at the surveys, and in there you see one interesting uh, uh, somehow result. Uh, and it is that uh, if you divide the households between uh, those who really are in the lower quintiles and those who are above, uh, the uh, slowness is mostly for the, those who, whose basket is more dependent on energy, electricity, energy, food, and so on. So this is, this is, and the others, they actually smooth. They are they're not that, that looking as much. Now, we also observe that these households are also the ones who change their, uh, who, who somehow pro look at the prices of these uh, products uh, with higher frequency. And uh, it, my presumption is that they will adjust if the prices actually will go down uh, as much. So in, it is very important, the, even for them, as for us, to have an idea of the incoming data in order to have an idea of the future. But they, most of, many of them are liquidity constrained, so, it's, so it is true that they may have a number of problems. It has also to be, seen, to be said that the fiscal we, policy has been successful. We've, we've been told that we have to hurry up because maybe they, they need this place <laughs> for another lecture. Um, the, I, I'm going to therefore um, just ask for one question from that side of the room, maybe from a person who is a, a student or a student-like figure, and then one question from this part of the room, a gentleman down there wearing a tie who is a very well-off student. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, but please, somebody from this side of the room first. Okay. Are you a student, sir? No. Oh. Is, there, is there a young person, younger even than you are, <laughs> sir? No, but this man here. But you were supposed to go with the yeah, yeah. No, but Please, there we are. No, somebody give that man a microphone, because otherwise they won't hear. If I don't uh, understand it, mostly. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you very much. So I'm a PhD student, so I hope that counts. Uh, so uh, this, this is a very good question about the current data that we're showing. So, um, I understand that aggregate demand in Europe is not as strong as in the US, but what do you think may be you know, the reason behind this core inflation being up so much uh, in Europe? Maybe Germany is even higher than the inflation now, or about it? So, yeah, you, you, you're not using that microphone okay. very effectively. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know if you heard okay. the question. Core inflation. Core, core inflation. Why is it what's higher? The yeah. What's the narrative that you see behind core inflation getting so high? If it's not aggregate Okay, and then, could, while he, he's answering that question, can you pass the microphone down immediately what, in, in front? Yeah. What was that? Core inflation? Yeah, why is the rise in core inflation going on in Europe, whereas it's not in the United States? Yeah, but it is also going on in yeah, the United yeah. States. So, so, the one would be what if it's not, so you were suggesting that it's not aggregate demand, because uh, in Europe, aggregate demand is not giving up as much as yeah. There are two, 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 two things. First is that the pass through of energy costs uh, is not immediate. So we are still observing now in final products 
uh, both produced and traded, there is a lag also between the production and trading, the effects of energy costs being uh, incre having increased so much during the last year and around the mid of last year, uh, and, and still being pretty high at the end of the year. They have reduced dramatically between January and March. So if this is kept that way, and if the pass-through continues to work as it used to do, then I would expect core prices to go down. If they don't, it is a signal that, and I will have to look at the what happens in profit margins in the business sector, it is a signal that there is a rigidity towards the bottom of mm. prices, and this may create a, enough space in the balance sheets of firms uh, to accommodate wage increases to compensate for the supply shock. And that is a second round. So we have to look at no, that. Thank you. Uh, to a uh, mature student, uh, Theo. Yeah, I, was, I was a student once. Mm. Um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, if you see second round effects, you'll need to tighten more to offset those second round effects. And I would say that certainly in some countries of the euro area, you're seeing very significant second round effects. So if you look at the wage increases, People are getting in Germany, you know, what their deal demanded, what the Emetal got last, last year, and indeed the sort of the, the wages in the less unionized sectors in countries like Germany. You've got significant second round effects. Does the ECB need to create meaningful slack to offset those second round effects? And then what impact does that have on countries like Italy, where wage growth so far is, is much lower? Well, second round effects, uh, we are observing wage increases in Germany and the Netherlands, which are much higher, or uh, requests which are much higher than, uh, than elsewhere in Europe. Uh, we are also observing the working of indexation, minimum wages being indexed in, in France, indexation amazingly being still there in Belgium. So, so these are components of these wage which push. So far, we don't see it generalized. We still have projections of rate of changes of wages, which are, for the time being, still much below the rate of change of prices, but over time, uh, still uh, not producing a spiral. Now, it may take place. It may take place if there is the kind of mechanism I was saying before. Mm. Uh, this means that we have to tie it more. Perhaps so we have to see, but there is the counter effect of credit being substantially down because it has been reacting substantially to interest rates. So these are the long, long lags, and I think we have to take that into account. It's the too much against too little, isn't it? Uh, uh, we're going to have to draw that to a close, although we could go on for another few hours, I'm sure. But thank you very much on thank behalf you. of myself and Celina. Thank you. And we're going to now hand over to Antonio to deliver the vote of thanks. Well, let's, uh, let's thank uh, the uh, Governor Visco, uh, Dr. Marsh and Professor Bahaj for uh, uh, First of all, for uh, a wonderful presentation by uh, Governor Visco, it was very clear and uh, insightful. Uh, many thanks and thanks for this conversation. And uh, thank you everyone, uh, as, uh, as David said, this could continue uh, for many hours. Well, at least we will continue for a few more minutes in the South um, Cloisters in the Wilkins building. So. Uh, you follow me, I follow Emma, and we'll get there. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> that was a bit further away than I was. As I say, you could go home. Yeah. If it had been the evening, we'd have some glasses of red wine. No, I'm not. You always forget me.